Prisons, good afternoon to everyone. Bid you shalom. Special greetings to all the Bradshaws and the immediate family members, the extended family, those whose lives have been touched by Bradley, whose life we celebrate and give God thanks for today, and all his co-workers out in your numbers, such as a good indication of the extent to which he made an impact at his most recent place of employ. We have been encouraged tremendously thus far in this service of Thanksgiving by the words of song. Thank you so much to those of you who sang and by the passages that have already been read and the tributes, the eulogy. And I'm thanking God for the, the thread that I see his hand weaving through this service. My task is to encourage us further from the Word of God and to challenge us from the life of Brady and from God's Word as to how now we should live. Let us then pause for prayer. Gracious Lord, you who have been offering strength and your everlasting arm to the family, you who brought Neville out of his mother's womb and have called him home. You have brought us here today. In a very real sense to confront ourselves, to confront the reality of our mortality. Attend unto us further now with strength and comfort for those who need it most. And attend unto us through the ministry of your Holy Spirit who has written your Holy Word and whose ministry it is to convict us of sin, of judgment, and of righteousness. Bless your word to us, O God, and cause that every word of your servant and every meditation of all of our hearts would find acceptance in your sight, even as we affirm that you are indeed our strength, our Lord, and our Redeemer. Amen. We're going to read for us from the then King's language, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, from verse 7 to verse 1 of chapter 5. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not destroyed. Always bearing about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our body. For we which live are always delivered unto death for Jesus' sake, that the life also of Jesus might be made manifest in our mortal flesh. So then, death worketh in us, but life in you. We have in the same spirit of faith according as it is written, I believe and therefore have I spoken. We also believe 
and therefore speak. Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. For all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many redound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not, but through our but though our outward man perish, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we look not at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. For you know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in the heavens. And then I want to read again verses 16 to 18 from our language. So even though we are yet old, and we body butter butter, from all we are going through, we are not here. Every day God makes our spirit strong, stronger and stronger. And we get the strength from and we get the strength to go on doing work. The little trouble and the suffering where we are going to no, not the last day ever. And them are nothing when you think about the nice, nice sitting them where God and will give you. When we reach a heaven. So we now watch the sitting them where we, where we can see. Because them sitting there now the last day ever. Instead of that, we watch the sitting them where we can see. Because them they sitting in their last day ever. I wonder, Mr. Wayne, what Brady would have done. If on one of those days when he opened the, the newspapers, newspaper to the obituary, he did in fact see his picture there. Actually, friends, there is one known man to whom that very thing happened. You might not know the name Alfred Nobel. But I suspect that you are aware of the Nobel Peace Prize awarded every year to persons who have made significant achievements in various fields, fields of medicine and literature and science and so forth. That prize was set up by Alfred Nobel. But before he got there, Alfred Nobel was known best for the man who invented dynamite. Alfred gained many, much riches from his invention of dynamite. At the time, very, very helpful in demolishing buildings and very, very helpful in demolishing human beings by evil ones. But Alfred had a twin brother. One day he decided to just chill out a bit because he had the resources. Him. His brother and himself, they shared an apartment in London. And before he set out to board the train to just tour the English countryside, as he was leaving, he accidentally took up his brother's wallet instead of his. And the train stopped at different cities, and at each stop, they would take on the daily newspaper, and Alfred was in his coach and just sifting through the newspapers. And then he got to the obituaries, and there, in larger size than all the other pictures in the obituaries that day, he saw his picture staring at him. And beneath his picture were written the words, We regret to inform the public of the passing 
of Alfred Nobel, a man best remembered for inventing dynamite, the most deadly substance known to man, substance by which, in an instant, hundreds of lives can be snuffed out. His brother back home, his twin brother had died. And when they came, it was his name, his identification that they found on his brother. And so the newspaper mistakenly printed his death announcement. Alfred got a rude awakening because he realized that if in fact it was he who had died, his life would have been summed up in the words under his picture in the newspaper. Death remembered for inventing dynamite, the most destructive substance, in an instant snuffing out hundreds of lives. Of course, he got off the train and took a train back to London, cleared up the misunderstanding. Then, with his earnings from dynamite, he set up the Nobel Peace Prize. He wanted to change what would be said of him when he actually died. The truth is, not many of us will have such an opportunity to rewrite the script, as it were. Here we are today with a very vivid reminder of our mortality. A very vivid reminder that life is heading in a particular direction. Paul, as he writes here in Corinthians, continues with his habit of putting two opposites against each other. So in his writings, he talks, for example, of flesh versus spirit. He talks about earth versus heaven. Here, he talks about the perishing and the everlasting. This little text that we have read today, I see two little lessons that I want to share with us. The futility of focusing on the outward and the fruitfulness of focusing on the internal. Paul talks here about the extent to which we are all facing a particular destination. Dean told us that Brady was an avid movie fan. I don't know, Dean, if he went to see this one, a movie with a curious name that came out a few years ago, The Curious Case of Benjamin Burton. Kind of a strange name for a movie. But essentially, the movie is about Benjamin Burton, who was born as an old man. And with each passing day, Benjamin Burton got younger. And so he aged in reverse. And I think I suspect that the writer and, and the director of that film, perhaps the writer in particular, was aiming at something deeper than just entertainment. I think he was using satire and comedy to cause us to reflect on something that we would rather avoid reflecting on. The fact that we are aging and we are getting older and we are deteriorating with each passing day. You see, death is morbid and we don't, we don't like to think about it. We wish we didn't like to think about it. Every year, when the sales studies are done, some of the industries that flourish, notwithstanding the recession and notwithstanding the presence of the IMF in various places, the industries that flourish the most are the ones that deal in products and services to defy aging. The cosmetic industry, Lotions and potions and creams and serums 
and tablets and drinks at, from the herbal and the natural to the synthetic, from the harmless to the harmful. We pursue the things that would give us a certain semblance of control over the process of deterioration. Paul, in his death here, does not avoid it. He confronts it. He says, though the outward man is perishing. He says, though this tent is dissolved. He confronts it. And in the text, he points us to the futility. It is futile. While it is good and while there is a sense in which we have a responsibility to be good stewards of our temples, the truth is all our efforts, as good as they are, our best efforts cannot bring us to a point where we escape that when all is said and done, it is futile to attempt to avoid that the outer man is perishing. But what I want us to consider is the futility of placing our focus there. To, 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 to live life in a way that would suggest that this outward man, this temple, this jar of clay, this earthen vessel, as Paul describes it in the text, that this is all there is. And by our conduct, we, we, we betray this sense as though our focus is there and that this is the end of man's existence. Our budget would suggest that this is the focus. The way we manage our time would seem to suggest often that this is the end, that this is the, 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 the pinnacle of man's existence and the purpose for man's life. That it is all about this outward, this outer man. The text calls us to realize that if that is where our focus is, we are engaging in an exercise in futility. For with all the money that there may be to buy the age-defying serums, and with all that there is to, to delay aging, the body still ages. With all the dark dyes, the white still push themselves up. With all the creams and potions, a little wrinkle here and a little wrinkle there to yeah. present themselves. Okay. And it's like, it's like losing battle. Yeah. So at the end of the day, it is still that. But since this is our end, how, how then should we live? I want to suggest that if we begin to realize that such a pursuit is futile, that perhaps there are some implications for how we live our lives, some implications for how we use our time, some implications for how we manage our relationships. The scripture is clear. Life at best is swift. There are green in front of us that in his firm. The scripture describes it says life is as a swift runner, a vapor, a mist. In Psalm 96, Moses, Moses exclaims with a sigh almost. We live to be 60 and, and, and 10 and 2 if we are strong. We end our days with a moan as the body takes its last breath. And Solomon is even more cynical in the book of the preacher Ecclesiastes. He says, I find this thing in common with humans, with dogs, with birds. They all die. If that is the reality, and it is futile to avoid thinking about the fact that the outer man is perishing. I think we ought to manage our time in such a way 
that reflects an understanding of how short our days are. David says, teach us to number our days correctly. Friends, much as we may speak boldly about what we will do and what we will do when, the fact of the matter is the time is not ours to determine. And we must maximize the time, maximize the opportunities. It suggests to us, friends, also that we must take care of our tempers, that the choices we make have serious implications, if not for our lives, but for the lives of others. I'm glad the JNT stand is here, and I hope some of the drivers are here, because I'm sure that your, your leaders impress it upon you that every moment that you go behind that steering wheel, every split second of what you do has implications for the 32 or 40 or 60 lives that are in your hands. Every choice we make has implications for this temple, this body. So the doctors speak to us about lifestyle diseases. And those account for the majority of death. Diseases that come to us as a result of how we live our lives. So yes, the food may taste just that little bit better with that extra pinch of salt. But it has serious implications for your heart. You may like, as some do, that extra fatty portion of the jerk work. But it has implications for the fact that the outer man is perishing. You may like your scotch on the rocks. And you may like to mix your guineas with the bull to the red. But it has implications for your liver. The older man is perishing for them. Our relationship. Do we value them? Do we take time out for the ones in our lives that are most important? In the few years that I, maybe three or four thereabouts that I knew, I knew Brady. Whatever else may be said, Prior to that, in those few years, I, I got a sense of a man who was trying with every fiber in his being to redeem the time. I don't know if he knew how much longer he had hair, but, but, but it, it seems as though he lived every day wanting to maximize the important relationships in his life. matter, friends. When all is said and done, in all our chasing and in all, in all our getting and in all our going after things, the goods of this world and feeling good in all our pursuits of goods and, and wanting to feel good, can we stop to remember that the outer man is perishing and therefore I need to make sure that I spend quality time with those relationships, managing those relationships well, and not taking persons for granted. Here before us today is a vivid reminder that time is short. The outer man is perishing. And it's futile to place our focus on the outer man. All of, all of the pampering, all of the, the, the nice thing of, all of the extensions and the colors and the Gucci and all of that. What, what, to, to what end? In the grand scheme of life, do they really matter and suggest to us like that ultimately they don't? Do you think Brandy can, can have any, any reflection right now, anything to care about whether he was put in a black suit or a gray suit? No, friends. It does not matter. Whether the suit that
that he is still now cost one dollar or a million dollars, it does not matter. In a matter of time, it will be nothing but dust. So does it really matter? That we spend so much time pampering the outer, the, the, the outer man and so much money on the outer man and so much energy on the outer man focusing on the outer man when it is perishing. Cute that. When it's hard to talk about the fruitfulness, the immense fruitfulness of the focus on the inner life. In that same verse it says, though, even though the outer man is perishing, it is perishing. We can't change that. We can't deny it. It is perishing. But the inner man is being renewed day by day. And that's where there is truth. That's where there is benefit. He says, look, we are perfect. We are troubled, we are afflicted, but there was a quality of life on the inside that the apostle shared with those to whom he was writing that placed the perishing of the outer man into perspective. A fruitfulness, a kind of result, the life of the inner man that produces this kind of result, that no matter what is happening to the outer man, there is something more solid on the inside. We are troubled on every side, yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Cast down, but not abandoned. That, friends, you don't get that kind of perspective. You don't get that kind of resolve. You don't get that kind of resilience from the outer thing. For whether it is sickness or sadness or loss, when they come at us and they come like a flood, no amount of clothes in your closet, no amount of money in the bank, no amount of prestige matters. The only difference perhaps is the ward that you may be placed on at the hospital. But at the end of the day, the outer man has little to offer to the troubles of life. Troubles, perplex, castle, persecution, forsaken. But, he says, there is always this opposite reaction. Why? Because he encourages, he suggests, he promotes the focus on the inner man that the word of God enjoins us to. That which God calls us to, to recognize that at the end of the day, this, this outer tent, this earthly house is just a cage, and the real person is on the inside, a person at a place that is in the hand of God, a person for whom Christ died, a person that God loves daily, so much so that he gave his very best. How, how careful are we to focus on the inner man? Friends, that's where the fruit is. Listen to the fruit. It says, knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise up us also by Jesus and shall present us with you. It says, our light and our temporary affliction it's working in us a far more eternal weight of glory. There's a work that God wants to do in all of us that brings us at a place where we recognize that the outer man, as important as it is, should be secondary in our focus. And that the fruit of focusing on the inner man is a hope, a solid foundation for a hope beyond this life. We plan and we prepare and we, we go through all kinds of, of, of expense to prepare for the external at the expense of our souls. I believe 
Brady would want us to be. Pause and seriously contemplate how am I living my life? Is it in the pursuit of the things that really matter? Am I chasing the wind? When all is said and done, does it matter how many baby mothers you have? Does it matter whether you were a jealous or not? Does it matter whether you were a bit hotty hotty or not? Does it matter the size of your bank account? No, it absolutely does not matter. That which matters is the inner man, the condition of the inner man. Is it well with your soul? The hope, the comfort, the real joy and encouragement for the family members in particular, those who have been slain and afflicted by the hand of death, is that Paul says, Lord, those who put faith in Jesus. We have this hope that the very same God who raised Jesus from the dead shall, shall raise us up also and shall present us with all those who have done likewise. I look at this lovely black and white picture of Brady on the front with his afro. Reminds me of when I had my fro. And I, 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 I just wish that, that there was a time lock, that, that he was always preserved like that. But 